Good morning. It's really exciting to be here. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm delighted to introduce as our first panel uh, presenter my boss and mentor, Dr. Marshall Chin. He is the Richard Perillo Family Professor of Healthcare Ethics in the Department of Medicine at the University of Chicago. He also currently serves as the National President for the Society of General Internal Medicine for our academic primary home. He's the director of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Reducing Healthcare Disparities Through Payment and Delivery System Reform Program Office. Um, he's the director of the Chicago Center for Diabetes Translation Research, and he's an associate chief and director of research in the section of general internal medicine, and also an associate director here at the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics at the University of Chicago. Dr. Chin works to improve diabetes care and outcomes on the south side of Chicago through healthcare system and community interventions. He's also, the leading, he's also leading the evaluation of the Commonwealth Fund project that is implementing the patient-centered care home in 65 safety nets across five states. He's also investigating how to improve shared decision making between clinicians and LGBT racial ethnic minority patients. Today, Dr. Chen will be speaking on the topic, improving shared decision making with LGBT racial and ethnic minority populations. Good morning. So this project is mostly funded by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, a little bit of funding from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. The closest I have to a for-profit funding is Merck Foundation, which is a philanthropy funded by Merck Company. So this is very much a team sport, this particular project, and my presentation represents the work of the whole team. I have here in, in purple members of the team that are affiliated with, with the McLean Center, either as alumni, faculty, or who have taught the fellows in some of the summer intensive lectures. Here's a part of our team, sort of one of our United Nations pictures. And I particularly want to acknowledge the following people on the slide who uh, much of the content for today's talk is drawn from their contributions. A uh, special shout out to uh, Justin Ja, who's an undergrad here at the UC, who's on our team as well as helped out with making some of the slides. So I'm going to describe the challenge of LGBTQ racial ethnic minority patient disparities and shared decision making. I'm going to outline a conceptual model for improving the shared decision making between clinicians and these patients, and I'll describe ongoing research for improving care in this area. I'm going to do this through a sequence of three cases. The first case is what I would call a, a setup for disaster, and it'll be an introduction into LGBTQ cultural competency 101. The second case, we'll talk a little bit about biases about Asian American women, and will lead us into a discussion of a conceptual model for shared decision making. The third case is called Nightmare at the Clinic, and it will again let, let us talk about a model for the environment in which we do shared decision making, and I'll end with some ongoing research of the group. So the first case is set up for disaster. So the clinical scenario is what's called HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP. So what's been found is that for high-risk patients, there's now a, a new combination pill of, of two antiretroviral drugs, which if given daily, taken daily, can reduce the risk of actually getting HIV by about 92 percent. So imagine that you're a clinician, and this is a patient that you've seen once before, a 24-year-old African-American man. And uh, he, he basically had given hints during his first visit that he was sexually active with men and women. He said he doesn't use condoms. And in your particular city, most of the sexual activity is within race, meaning African Americans having sex with African Americans, or white people having sex with white people. Uh, you did some basic testing because of the, the sexual activity history and found out that he was HIV negative but positive for gonorrhea. So you're bringing him back for a, a second visit. So only the second time you've seen him. And then here are your goals for the visit. You want to review these test results and then take a more detailed sexual history. You want to discuss why this patient may be a good candidate for this new HIV PrEP medication. And you want to engage in shared decision making about PrEP. You know, talking about the clinical situation, the pros of taking PrEP, the cons, uh, and come up with a decision. So, you know, it should feel very, very comfortable, I think, to most of the clinicians, you know, basic decision making. Uh, and then ultimately, too, I mean, this is the second visit with this patient. You want to build the clinician patient relationship. Now put yourself in the patient's shoes. So you have a steady relationship with, with women, and you occasionally have sex with men. You identify as being heterosexual. You thought, you know, am I bisexual or not, but you know, this didn't feel right at this time. Uh, you don't use condoms because, well, you, you don't have AIDS and you know, you're not promiscuous. 
In fact, you have sex with normal guys, you know, not, not, gay, not gay guys. And you have a, a friend, a gay white friend, who comes from that, that gay white neighborhood on the, on the north side of town. Uh, in fact, that's what you associate with being gay, you know, your, your gay white friend. You have a very strong identification with the African American community. And really, under no circumstances are you going to take PrEP because if I do, well, you know, people will think I'm gay or that I have AIDS. So you can see how this is really sort of a, a setup for bad things happening in this particular encounter. And I put down here on this, this slide just some of the challenges that you know, might arise during your, your this encounter with the patient. You know, the challenges of the sexual identity versus actual sexual behavior and how it's a pretty good chance you're going to uh, make some mistake or blow something in terms of the language you're using with the patient. This issue is what, what is the patient's community? You know, is it the African American community? Is it the, the LGBT community? Something else? How do you tailor your counseling and the serious decision making for this particular patient? There are some hints here of internalized homophobia, so self-hatred of this patient, discrimination against LGBT folks, discrimination based on race. It also raises the issue of are some issues more important than health? in terms of you know, this person's identity, and the issue of determining identity at one's own pace. How do you be supportive? So this, this larger project, we have three specific aims. One is to systematically review what are the key issues regarding sheer decision making in the LGBTQ racial ethnic minority population around certain paradigmatic conditions. Second, and what we're doing right now is basically taking input from a diverse set of stakeholders regarding what do these patients want regarding this decision making. And then the final part of the project next year will be developing tools and disseminating uh, sending information both locally and nationally. So it turns out when you do the, the literature review, there's very, very little on uh, the intersection of, of uh, shared decision making in LGBTQ racial ethnic minority patients. Most of the literature has to do with just basic sort of cultural competency regarding LGBT patients more generally. Now let's go over like, some of the basic concepts so that you'll, you'll have some sense here. Uh, so first, you know, what does sexual orientation mean? Well, three different dimensions. One is your identity. I mean, you identify as being bisexual, lesbian, gay, queer, or straight. Uh, your actual behavior, you have sex with men, women, or both. Uh, what is your attraction uh, to which genders uh, physically and emotionally? Queer is a, a, a complex topic, uh, basically trying to reflect that, that oftentimes there are no like, clear boundaries between some of these definitions. And I'll explain this with two quotes. Uh, the first quote is here by Thomas Dunning. I love the word queer because it doesn't tell you anything about me and has room for all the flowing shades of my or anyone's sex, sexuality, emotions, politics, spirituality, family, and gender. To me, it's beautiful and strong and all-encompassing and all-inclusive. While there are definitely parts of me that could be labeled gay man, that identity has never felt comfortable in me. While we want to be seen as more than homosexual, many of us are also homo-emotional, for example, right? And want to be seen as more than a gay man with his presumptions of disco love and empty consumerism. Queer tells you I'm so much more than that, and yet reveals nothing at the same time. So I'll come back with a second quote that will flush this out in a little more detail. So gender identity, gender identity is your uh, internal sense of your gender. Uh, do you feel male, female, neither, or both? Expression is how you present your gender identity, such as through your speech, or your dress, or your behavior. So you can see then that you know, in your head there's gender identity, your eternal sense, there's then in your heart, you know, your sexual orientation, attraction, identity, behavior, and then biologically there's your sex, your sex assigned at birth anatomically. Here's the second quote. Gender queer, gender bender, boy. I don't really see myself as one sex over the other. I am biologically female, although I have had female to male top surgery. I am not on testosterone, because I don't feel that like being labeled male would make me feel closer to what I feel like I am. And what am I? Something in between. One slide on health disparities that, uh, so it turns out the LGBT population has a lot of health disparities. Uh, generally, there's a much higher prevalence of certain type of mental and behavioral health disorders. Um, we've heard, for example, like uh, with the past year, then uh, decreased attention to transgender. Transgender women are at high risk for suicidal thoughts and attempts. Um, and the stunning 44% of LGBT people have been threatened with violence uh, and sexual assault. And uh, a lot of data was put down at the bottom of the line here that if you're LGBTQ and a racial ethnic minority, then you frequently do worse in terms of these disparities. So some basic issues here. Um, so gender identity does not necessarily equal sexual orientation. In the LGBT, you can't really lump it as a whole category. It really is L, G, B, and T. Gender identity and sexual orientation can change over time and can be fluid. So again, it's not sort of a rigid sort of a system here. And as the first case demonstrated, the three components of sexual orientation do not always align. 
you cannot always quickly guess someone's sexual orientation or gender identity. We, we have a story that um, you know, we have a big team. Uh, probably one of the three most um, uh, sort of people who have the most experience with the LGBT community is uh, one of the folks helping us with recruitment, who's an uh, African-American lesbian. And uh, a bunch of us were interviewed by the Windy City Times uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, which is the major LGBT newspaper in the city, about our project. And uh, the interviewer asked, well, who in the team is uh, from the community? And uh, you know, uh, this, this uh, expert um, on our team actually guessed wrong in terms of uh, some of the folks on our team. Uh, race and ethnic identity may come before sexual orientation or gender identity. Once you know one LGBT person, you know one LGBT person. The importance of establishing a safe environment in your organization, assuring confidentiality. And sometimes things don't have to do with LGBT. Sometimes a cold is just a cold, not a transgender cold. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this. Listen to how people uh, describe their identities and the language they use, and your own language. So, for example, uh, instead of do you have a wife, are you in a relationship? We talked about uh, using, like, people use their own terminology, um, not satisfying your own curiosity about things. Uh, pay attention to your unspoken language, your body language, expression, for example. We talked about using your preferred name or pronoun. You know, no matter how experienced what you are, sooner or later you're going to make a mistake uh, in terms of uh, something that may be perceived as being disrespectful. And you know, say, I'm sorry, I did not mean to be disrespectful. And if a patient's name doesn't match insurance and medical records, you know, try to find out, well, you know, maybe there is a different name that's being used. And we'll come back to that. Slides uh, largely from John Schneider. Remember that families, friends, community groups, and religious spiritual organizations may have rejected, ostracized, verbally abused, physically abused, or thrown away your patients due to their orientation or identity. Some patients have experienced sexual abuse, rape, or trauma, and some patients have had discriminatory healthcare experiences. So, talking about the ethical practice of, of uh, cultural competency, and, and I think Pearl Robbins will talk a bit about this also later today. Recognizing, recognizing one of those biases and community dynamics, a sensitivity to cultural differences, the avoidance of generalizations about cultures, culturally competent care, challenging racism, heterosexism, genderism, and sexism among colleagues, the institution, or the community at large. So we're now going to segue into the, the second case here, shared decision-making intersectionality in uh, this, this mix of race, ethnicity, and uh, gender identity, sexual orientation. The second case uh, comes from Judy Tan, one of our, our colleagues at the University of California, San Francisco. Some of the biases about Asian American women. So Michelle is a second generation, 53-year-old Taiwanese queer, cisgender, so transgender, opposite, cis, same, cisgender woman in a long-term relationship with a cisgender woman. She's experienced racism within mainstream gay spaces, and she's a formidable advocate in the Asian American Pacific Islander LGBTQ community. However, she's been stigmatized, she's been stigmatized within the Asian community, and therefore she's not out to her family. She comes in today for a pap smear as part of a routine exam with her new physician, Dr. Steve, a 45-year-old straight African-American cisgender man. Prior to the exam, Dr. Steve asked Michelle, is she sexually active? which Michelle says yes to. Upon examination, it becomes clear that Michelle has not had penetrative intercourse and that the exam is painful. Dr. Steve quickly ends the exam without providing sexual health risk reduction counseling or STD testing. He assumes that Michelle is not sexually active, but rather she's naive and limited in English proficiency. Dr. Steve recommends that Michelle reference materials on sexuality and reproductive health in her native language. Though confused and unsettled by Dr. Steve's actions, Michelle is deferential and allows herself to be shown out. So Monica, in a couple of talks, is going to go into much more detail about shared decision making. Just in brief, in this collaborative process we talked about that involves information sharing, uh, discussion, and decision making between clinician and patient. And Monica will go into this model into more detail that she took the lead on developing. But I'll just say that, you know, this what we say to each other during an individual encounter, and then what's it in our heads. And so, we, you know, we're all familiar with the story about Ahmed Mohammed uh, and, uh, you know, basically a racial profiling. There's a couple aspects of the story that many people here probably are not familiar with. One is that the mayor of that city, Irving, Texas, had said a number of Islamophobic comments earlier. So, you know, it's the stage in terms of society. The other is this sort of heartbreaking interview that MSNBC did with him, maybe I think it was a couple days after the event. Uh, so, I remember sort of seeing it on YouTube. And then the question was, well, what was your immediate reaction when you were arrested by, you know, the police here, taken away? And he said, well, my initial reaction was, oh, it's true. It's what people have already told, always told me, that I'm a terrorist. You know, so it's all self-perception that was sort of colored then by, you know, what people have been to telling him and, and what society has as a, as a norm. 
You know, so is Michelle's case an issue of miscommunication or are there these intersectionality issues, you know, in terms of a limited awareness of Dr. Steve of a heterogeneity within the Asian population, a stereotypic interpretation of a sexually inexperienced woman with limited English proficiency, you know, the perpetual foreign uh, image, and then this issue of deference, you know, why was Michelle a different, a first generation Taiwanese American, um, there were some issues of internalized heterosexualism, not going to be speaking out, avoiding conflict, and then interestingly too, there are always the implicit and explicit signals we send as providers in the language we use and the body language we use with patients. And so he was not very welcoming in terms of saying that's a safe environment for her. Again, a whole variety of issues in areas in terms of the heterogeneity of the Asian population, culturation, English proficiency. Language barriers, cultural norms. So for some of the LGBT issues, this issue of, of filial piety and continuation of bloodlines being a particularly relevant issue. Stigma, so fear of being out in the Asian community, rejection for family and community, internalized racism and homophobia. And the issue of multiple minority group identities. So in some ways, like Michelle being really sort of isolated from both the LGBT community as well as the heterosexual community, these uh, sexual stereotypes, so for example, um, you know, the submissive Asian man, so always in the submissive sexual position, or the exoticized submissive Asian woman sex worker. And uh, there's a whole history of Asian exclusion and discrimination, ranging from immigration policy to um, the Japanese internment, for example, during World War II. So we talk about in this particular paper, the importance of establishing a safe environment, having language appropriate materials, uh, specifically asking patients, how can I better understand you in terms of your identities as both Asian as well as LGBTQ, disclosure being particularly difficult for Asian Americans and the heterogeneity. And understanding your own stereotypes, your own implicit biases, what are the stereotypes or implicit biases you may have about accents, body size, model minority status, sexual exoticization, and how this may impact how you impact and deliver care to your patients? And this third case here, which I call Nightmare at the Clinic, a 29 year old Puerto Rican patient, he's a transgender male. His biological sex is female. He prefers being called he and him. His orientation is bisexual. His legal name is Carolyn Jesse Perez. His preferred name is CJ Perez. So this patient's coming in for a visit, and the last visit, his uh, provider discussed the need for cervical cancer screening. But he was reluctant to proceed because he did not like being engaged in such personal and intimate activities so associated with females. It's also the necessity of dealing with this. It's causing him a lot of anxiety, frustration. He's really ambivalent about having a pap smear. So it's going to be a difficult encounter. So when the patient arrives at the clinic, you know, he sees a new staff at the front desk. You tell the receptionist that your name is CJ Perez. She cannot find you in the system. You ask to look some more. After she searches for what seems to be an attorney, you let her know in a quiet voice, your legal name is Carolyn Perez. She seems flustered and confused, but repeats all of this information loudly. You notice that the guy who also plays pickup basketball at the recreation center, and for whom you have not disclosed your status, is waiting nearby. Overhearing your conversation with the receptionist, he looks up at the two of you and then quickly looks away. Receptionist asks for your insurance card and driver's license. So he gets her supervised with conflicting names and gender between the driver's license and the medical record. The people behind you in line seem to be annoyed, and you hear one of them let out a frustrated sigh. The receptionist loudly tells the medical assistant, Carolyn Perez has arrived for her appointment. So, you know, being out of here, that uh, increased risk then for physical, sexual, or verbal abuse. It, the relationship with his friend at the recreation center could be permanently affected. You know, at a minimum, the patient's developing negative perceptions of the clinic and potentially you as a provider. And then again, at a minimum, you're probably going to find an angry, frustrated, demoralized patient when you enter the room. So another one of our papers is uh, one where um, we have um, uh, this model for the environment that which sure decisions may take place. Uh, and I'm just going to go through this very quickly. That uh, we don't, this, this uh, timing system's not working here, so, but I'm assuming I'm sort of running out of time, probably. Yeah, okay. Um, so we talked about like, like six aspects of the environment that can impact um, care. So for example, workflow, having private space, obviously be very important in this example. Information technology, discussing what should be put in the record, patient chosen terms, for example. <coughs> the organizational structure, for so right now, for example, at the University of Chicago, we have a big diversity inclusion initiative trying to make the, the organization more diverse uh, and equitable. Uh, so it's a major uh, different <coughs> Uh, examples for giving, uh, putting LGBT symbols and artwork of LGBT racial ethnic minority patients uh, in your waiting area, for example. Gender neutral restrooms is a big issue right now in the, in the news. Cultural competency, shared decision making training. 
and then rewards. So, for example, um, rewarding production of disparities in different areas, highlighting LGBTQ issues within your website and the newsletters. So, just in brief, that we're continuing to do this project at the qualitative stage right now. We've had a number of kickoff events recruiting patients. Uh, here's our general flyer, transgender flyer. But uh, we've had uh, a couple of events with some of the Latino organizations on the west side, uh, African American organizations on the west and the north side, on the south, on the west side also. Howard Brown's health center was on the north side, um, and then we're also then engaging the questions, for example, like um, uh, trying to understand dual identity. So how, for example, as Black or African American identity and being LGBTQ affected your daily life and how you interact with the world. We're also um, similarly. Uh, interviewing providers in terms of competency about uh, the, these issues and uh, what they think some additional concerns are in caring for this population. So I want to end here as leave us a little bit of time for discussion and question and answers. So the conclusions are that you know beliefs, perceptions, values, images matter. Trust and history measure. You can't address what you don't know. And that's also really critical to address the emotions as well as the technical issues. And that's multi-level, interpersonal issues, improving systems, and enacting policies to improve shared decision-making to LGBTQ racial and ethnic minority patients. Thank you. So um, the, the, the boss has said that we have uh, some uh, time for a few questions. Framework, can one be a good physician to patients who identify themselves in these various ways without affirming the framework in which the identity is understood? It's a very thought provoking question, uh, Dr. Carolyn. Um, you know, I think like uh, all of us as clinicians, and in some ways the issue of LGBT, racial ethnic minorities, race issues that are generalizable to the diversity, all types of diversity. And uh, I think that is sort of a, a common core that, you know, as clinicians, we try to understand our patients as best as possible. And we know like from your work, for example, also we need to think about the own, our own impressions and biases and belief systems that we bring to the encounter also. But the bottom line is to, that we all agree that, well, the goal is to try to have the health outcomes and well-being of the patient be number one. I don't see anything that, that is discordant. I think that's consistent with your work also. Thanks. Yeah, I, th I think you're, you're conflating um, um, uh, the, the, the term that you're using. What was that term you used, Far? I don't know which term you mean. <laughs> if you're acknowledging it, what was that? Without affirming. Oh, affirming. Yeah, I think you're mixing up affirming and judging. Um, so you can, you don't have to affirm, but I think the problem is that people judge the, these people. And so I think um, the, the, the problem is not so much that you need to affirm people's lifestyle, is that you need to not judge them. Okay. Right. I think a lot of it is awareness that, that like one of those balls in the last slide was, you know, you can't address what you're not aware of or that you don't even know it may be an issue. And so you know, that's part of the purpose of this project as we're trying to understand, you know, what are going to be issues that are important to the LGBTQ racial ethnic minority population. You know, essentially, our, our team, we have a lot of experienced people on it and disparities, including people who work at this interface, but we rapidly became humbled in terms of like how little is known about this area. And so we're hoping to shed a light on it. Hi, um, could you speak to working with LGBT uh, children at all and in terms of navigating if someone's transitioning and maybe their parents don't agree or there's tension there? So I, I'm, I'm not an expert on um, sort of adolescents or children in LGBT. Um, Challenging what I've heard from other people on the team um, is a, it's a challenging area because also, as we mentioned, that um, gender identity itself is a sort of a fluid uh, issue. Uh, and so I think it's back to some of these fundamental core concepts of, of uh, being open-minded um, to try to understand where uh, the, the, the child is coming from, where the family is coming from, um, looking out for the, as the ultimate outcome, you know, what's in the best interest of the person's well-being, uh, but uh, basically trying to be open-ended and addressing these issues directly. Thank you.